It is a huge honor today to be lecturing to a man that I have known and admired for literally 25 years. I, I met you clear clear back, was it the LVI days? I think I met, might have met you in... Before then. Yeah. Yeah, how long? I mean, we, we've known each other forever. But I, I have to, I, I, you were on cutting edge. You, you jumped out and saw cosmetic dentistry as a specialization and niche area that that consumers wanted and you were you were on that you when i think of the um cosmetic revolution i really give a lot of credit to iva claire bob ganley saw it with uh, empress and and tooth colored and then and then um guys like you were jumping in on it and uh and 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 congratulations dude you made it to the president of the american academy of cosmetic dentistry how cool is that well, now I'm the past president, so it feels pretty good. So my first question to you is, who is more fun to look at, the past president you or the current president, Joyce Bassett? Well, that depends on your point of view. <laughs> she uh, she actually lives up street from me. It's funny. My, yeah. I was climbing a Camelback Mountain on Christmas morning. They always have a Santa Claus up there. So we all got up at 5 o'clock and drove down there. And uh, who did I see at the top of Camelback Mountain on Christmas morning with Santa Claus? Uh, Joyce Bassett. Joyce is out there about every day climbing Camelback. Is she a day? Is she, well, that's that's the ultimate stairmaster because I notice when I do, I work out every morning from five to seven, and when I'm on a stairmaster, it takes so much discipline to not get off. True. But when you go climb a mountain, your mind relaxes because you know you're going to go to the top, so you think about other stuff. Yep. Then as soon as you get top, you turn around and you think, oh great, now it's downhill, and then I'm done. So I I um I got a mountain across the street from me, South Mountain. And I, I just can't do stationary. I can't do stationary bikes or stair mats. I got to do something where my mind's not looking at the clock for an hour. You know what I mean? Looking at the task. Yeah. So what? So what did you learn as as uh, in your journey? Well, well, first of all, just think this as past president. Why should one of these? This is probably going to be about. I think the last episode I had seven thousand uh, dentists listen to this. What would you tell? Of those 7,000 dentists, why should somebody join the American Academy of Cosmetic Dentistry? Oh, that's a great question. Uh, I was fortunate, I think, to be, just going back a little historically, uh, 1994, I joined the AACD, and it was because Bill Dickerson said, you should join the AACD. And Bill <laughs> was, he was, you know how he is, he's uh, pretty forceful and direct, and he was right. And it was a great organization. He, then he said, you have to go for accreditation. And I said, oh, what's that? Well, okay, so I signed up for that. And I got into with a cadre, I might say, of uh, contemporaries, all of whom became accredited, and many, many of them are still luminaries in the profession today. And the camaraderie has just been wonderful. The learning experience has been wonderful. So having said that, we know in AACD we don't own cosmetic dentistry, but we try to be uh, the best at uh, disseminating information. Now, in the 20 years since I joined, it's changed significantly. As you know, it's got significant market penetration. Anybody can hang out a shingle and say they're a cosmetic dentist, but I happen to feel that the people who are in the AACD have a different mindset, most of them, and their mindset towards trying to do the very best they can for their patients and learning how to do it the very best way. Cosmetic dentistry, by definition, in my view, is just simply good, good, solid, restorative dentistry, but it is a certain process on a discipline that you have to learn and study. <clears throat> I, you know, did I answer that question okay for you? You, you actually um, nailed it for me personally because when I look back at getting my um, fellowship in the mission institute, I don't think of uh, um, the accreditation or the fellowship or my diplomat and implants or anything. I think of my friends that I met there that have now been my friends through this whole journey. And I mean, the first guy I sat down next to at the Mish class was Stephen Razer. I mean, how how cool was that? I mean, you know, when you know, just I mean, so yeah, so I I I think that when you join a society, you're a social animal, and the biggest funnest thing about any of those organizations is you go there and you meet somebody of like mindedness, and now you got a buddy who can talk this with you for the rest of your life, and it's just cool. So be specific though. How much does it cost to join the AACD? And how do I become a credit? It's a, I see accreditation, and is accreditation is that when you see a dentist's name like yours with after DDS, it says F A A C D, or that's the fellowship? That's the fellowship, right? So, how much uh, does it cost to join, and what's the difference between accreditation and fellowship, and what exactly do I got to do to get both of those? Well, accreditation is a matter of uh, 
documenting five specific case types, phot photography, photographically, and then also doing a case report, a write-up, and then submitting by uh, in digital format specific photographs for each case type. There's five case types. Shall I name them for you? Absolutely. All right. Uh, the first, the flagship case type, would, what I call the flagship, is porcelain veneers. So it used to be called uh, six or more porcelain veneers. Now we call it six or more indirect restorations because the dividing line between a veneer and a crown might be different in any case. You know how it is. You might have a crown on number eight. You might have something that has more margins than the state of Florida on nine. You might call it a veneer. You might call it a three quarter crown. Whatever. So it's called six or more Indirect restorations, it's all on upper anterior teeth. All the restorations are on upper anterior teeth. Uh, case type two is tooth replacement case. And you're testing my memory here. I should know this stuff by heart, but I think I do. Case type two is tooth replacement case. No, I'm, I'm, that's, I'm sorry, that's number three. Two, take, case type two is one or more indirect restorations. And this tests, each case type tests a different skill set. So, for instance, for case type one, we have six or more indirect restorations. You're testing your ability to prepare, your ability to diagnose, your ability to treat. But you're also testing your ability to communicate with a laboratory technician to get what you want because what the patients see is his work or her work, not yours. What, what lies beneath the surface is what you did. So case type one is six or more. Case type two is one or two. So that tests the ability to match shade, possibly to match composite to, to porcelain possibly to mass portion of natural tooth structure. So those are different skill sets. The symmetry is important in case type one, and smile design comes more into, into play in case type one. Case type two, where it's one or two indirect, it's typically a central incisor. It can be two lateral incisors, it can be two central incisors. So that's pretty much how that goes. Case type three is tooth replacement case. And when I went through the accreditation in 1996, six, seven, eight, most people are doing fixed bridges to replace the tooth. Now most people are doing dental implants, and the results are phenomenal. As an examiner since 1999, I've seen lots and lots and lots of cases, and I really, really can stand behind it and say I'm really proud of the cases that we see come through and what the quality of dentistry we're seeing. It's amazing. It blows you away. Case type 4 is uh, typically a, uh, done with composite resin, and it's uh, either a diastema closure or a class 4 incisal uh, re replacement, and that is uh, the most commonly passed case. Let's say that's, I'm going to say not the easiest, but that's the most uh, straightforward case to do. It does test your ability to handle resin. It tests your ability to match resin to tooth structure, but smile design typically doesn't come into, the, into that so much. The, the last case would be the direct bonding case, and we call that six or more direct restorations, all on anterior teeth, so it's going to be canine to canine, and you as a dentist know very well that if you just do the six teeth, you're typically missing something out. You oftentimes have to go back one first premolar, second premolar to make the smile come out right. So the case type one is six more indirect. Case type two is two, one or two. Case type three is tooth replacement. Case type four is, let's just call it the diastema closure. Case type five, the flagship case, is six or more direct restorations. And that's the one that's toughest for most people. It was for me. Okay, and then what would you have to do to be a fellow to get the F A? Well, first of all, if you get accredited, is there anything after your name that? Yeah. Could, what, what's after your name on an accredited? Well, we, I I typically don't use it because it's a whole string of letters and it doesn't mean a lot to <laughs> a lot of people. But you can put A A A C D. So you're accredited by the American Academy of Cosmetic Dentists. So the A A C D with an extra A. Yeah. And A, then the AACD. And the means. ones that you've seen, FAACD, which are, I think there are only about 50 fellows now, Joyce happens to be one, uh, is, is the next level above accreditation. Now, the difference between the two is that you document five cases with accreditation, but with fellowship, you document 50 cases. Holy it's, moly. Right, but the documentation for the five cases is very much more in depth. You have, to, you have to have 12 before photos and 12 before, 12 after photos that are specific to, the, to cosmetic dentistry. They're all the same, same views, same magnification, and so forth. So 12 and 12. For the fellowship case, you only have to have uh, before and after two cases, a smile case and then a retracted case, in a, what we call a one to two view. So. Okay, I want, I want to, uh, you know, they, I, my, my favorite mantra is, success, you know, we're social animals, so we're programmed. We all got to get along. We all got to follow the 400-pound gorilla because we're only going to survive if we all work together. <clears throat> so it's against our nature to ask an ugly 
uh, question. I call it the 4,000-pound uh, gorilla question. When I'm hanging out with five dentists at a bar and we're watching an NFL football game, and whenever veneers come up, you always hear people grumbling, saying, yeah, but if it was their own daughter, would they have filed off all the enamel on the front six teeth and done veneers? Or would they have um, done um, direct composite or maybe uh, six-month braces, power procs with Rick DePaul or bleaching? Or So my, 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 my crazy question to you is, uh, do you think uh, if some 21-year-old, if your 21-year-old daughter came in, and she, her teeth weren't um, 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 movie star. Would you remove the enamel on her front upper ten teeth and do indirect veneers, or would you do direct compot? Would you do ortho bleaching, direct compot? You know what I mean? Do you, so do you, do you understand what yeah. I'm asking? Of course I do, but there's a lot of ways to answer that question. First of all, as a dentist, you have to do diagnosis, and you have to understand what interdisciplinary features are available to you now. Let's go back about 25, let's go back about 30 years, back to 1985 when uh, Robert Ibsen brought some veneers into the marketplace. I first saw him in 1985 lecturing on porcelain veneers. It was, a, it was a phenomenon. And yet I looked at all of his work and I thought, those things all look bulky and over contoured, except for one case where he had just done a single tooth. And I asked him after the lecture, did you not have to prep that? And he said, yeah, I had to prep it. So I figured, hmm, got to prep it. So going forward in time, when Empress came into the marketplace, it allowed the lab technician, who was a hometown lab, to get world-class quality because the press ceramics became easier to do. The drawback to that was we had to prep the teeth a lot. So we've gone from Bob Ibsen's no prep, no shots, no drilling, to prepping the teeth, asking the laboratory technician to get very involved in the case, to do a whole lot more of smile design with us. And now it's come full circle the other way with uh, Dennis Wells, I think, can be con congratulated for bringing back the no prep or minimal prep uh, uh, situation. So I'm, I'm going to answer your question, but you got to let me finish this. Who, who, who did, I remember who, 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 when who, 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 I saw you lecture the first time. You were on your very first cross-country tour. I think you were 27 years old. You, Howard Friend, remember that? I do. You came, you came to Sacramento. You were hilarious. <clears throat> <laughs> we were we were so happy to have a fresh face talk, say the real things about dentistry. And you remember what you said. I'm not going to go into it. But back to your question. Um, and I've had a lot of respect for you since then. I've seen you do amazing things since your first cross country tour when you were having to load up the bus with your your stuff by yourself. I, I know how it was. I've talked to Craig Steichen was the one who told me about that. That's right, Chris, Craig. So you went to school with him. So anyway, back to your question. It's, it's an unfair question in some ways because I can't say with a blanket statement what I would do, but typically the thinking today is to be as conservative to tooth structure as you possibly can. Given this, the fact that the patient's going to own those teeth the rest of his or her life, we may not interact with them for more than a couple hours or a week or so. So you got to make sure that what you do and goes in there has some predictability of longevity with it. Force them in here, sure, but you're asking for trouble if you just go in there and wholesale, slay a whole bunch of enamel, and pop on force them in here. So you'll get a good result to start with, but is that the best result? So you, individual you know, variation. So I want to ask you another question, which is a play on what Carl Misch told me back in 87. Um, someone, I, I, I said to him, I said, you know, how, how did – how, how did you get so good at implants? And he says, you know, how hard he says it was cross training. I started off in removable, and I was watching these people having these implants snap of the gum line. They were all blaming on a weak implant, and I was looking at their denture, saying, "Dude, you'd, you'd miss the bite. You didn't. You, you know, you you can't. You have to get the forces and the mechanics, and and you got to know how to build a correct denture before you can learn how to make a denture over implants." And I look at some of – and so my question to you is, don't you kind of think that's true with cosmetic dentistry? If you're a dentist and, and your only tool is a is an indirect veneer and you can't do um, power proc six-month braces or six-month smiles or if you, if, you don't, if you don't have any type of unraveling orthodontic short-term ortho skills, can you really be a cosmetic dentist if you can't sometimes unravel the case? Because some, some of these cases I, I see – you know, I, I, I tell them, you know, if you just let me unravel this for four months, four months, six months, 
this is going to be such a better case. Right. So, so yep. do you need to be cross trained at least in short term ortho to be a really rocking hot? Well, let me go back. We're starting to fade out here, having a bit of a, a lag, oh. but I'll, I'll I'll answer your question. I the answer is a definitive and and uh, vociferous yes. You should have a significant knowledge in, in every dis discipline. Dan Maeda, who's a past president of the AACD, a very competent dentist who practiced in Hawaii, wrote one time: Cosmetic dentistry is a specific prosthodontic discipline that requires significant study and care. So it's a, a separate discipline that requires study and care. And if power prox comes into it, great. If uh, orthodontics is, is certainly should be considered, certainly should be. And the patient has to be, of course, made aware of all the options that are available. Just like John Coyce said one time years ago, if it makes a difference for the rest of your life, can you do it for six months? So that's, that's to answer my question. You want to be as conservative as possible. Conservative to tooth structure, has, if it has to do with orthodontics, absolutely. I sent an adult patient to the orthodontist just yesterday. I, I see. Um, I've always, the one thing I've always wondered about the orthodontist is the same thing I worry about the wonder about the oral surgeon is, you know, it seemed like when I got out of school 28 years ago, you know, someone needed an implant. You know, someone someone's denture didn't fit. The only option an orthodontist had was a pretty much a fifty thousand dollar treatment plan. You know, six implants, all you know, the stuff. And now you're starting to see the smart ones say, well, we have a Cadillac, but we also for fifty thousand, and we have a Chevy for five thousand with mini implants. And you're starting to see some of the leading oral surgeons in Germany placing as many minis as they do uh, full roof form. And I've always wondered, how come the orthodontist, same thing, you go in there with crowded teeth, they only have one treatment plan, a two-year, $7,000 case, and they don't ever really offer, uh, well, here's the other alternative for half the price, short-term ortho for six months. I, I've always wondered why they don't see market segmentation because it's not only in price, but time. One is six thousand in two years. Why don't they offer a three thousand in six months? Why? Why do you think that is? There's ten thousand of them out there, and I don't see any of them marketing that. Well, I I would guess that the reason is because uh, it's ha it has to do with your patient population and your referral base. So if your referral source is not knowledgeable, then you're not going to offer the patient something that may be uh, may be best for the patient or may be an option for the patient. You know. Uh, a six-month period or one-year one period for $3,000 may not get you the optimum results that the orthodontists are trained to look for and trained to like, but they're, if they're willing to accept certain limitations, then I think it's, it's fine to do. My local orthodontist uses temporary anchorage devices all the time, and that's the mini implant uh, approach, right? Right. I want to ask you another uh, – um, I want you to answer this uncomfortable question for a dentist. A lot of dentists – don't want to get into cosmetics because they have this nightmare of some woman coming in with three pages of notes about her teeth and pictures of how she looked on prom night in high school and they don't they don't want to deal with a crazy lady with all these high expectations and be married you know then does that so how does a guy like you who have done a gazillion of these cases how do you weed out the crazy people with unexpectations you think they're going to get veneers and look 20 years younger and and, and versus someone who's a moderate who will say, wow, that was a really nice improvement. Well, it all goes back to inform before you perform. You're always going to have somebody come in who has a stories about six or seven different dentists that she's been to. That's a big red flag. You know that. <laughs> well, or, well talk, talk to these younger kids because we're older. Yeah. Talk to these kids that just got out of school, how, uh, inform before you perform. Well, and, don't, yeah, the, the, the byword is don't be too eager. Make sure you know what you're doing before you get into it. Don't. Don't wait until the patient gets in the chair and you get into trouble and you have to call your lab technician and you're, and you're in a push or call your mentor and say, what do I do now? Make sure you have your guns loaded before you go in there. And as far as the patient goes, they're going to want to know, well, let's put it this way. Most patients don't know what they don't know. They don't, they don't, but they know what they've seen on television. Some patients are very astute and they look very, very deeply into things and they know a whole lot more about porcelain veneers than you'd expect them to know. But when they say, I think I need veneers, what they're really saying, you have to get deeper than that and say, what is it, what's the question at heart? What's your, as uh, uh, Gail Bootcamp used to say, what's your dominant buying motive? What do you really want? So a patient comes in, they're pointing to one, two, Tooth here, I always stop them and say, 
back off here. Let's talk about the big picture. I see that one tooth might be a bothersome tooth, but what, in, in the larger sense, what do you really want? So talking to these younger dentists that are just recently out of school or haven't been practicing for, for a decade or so, it's, it's a psychological game that we play all the time. The people that win at the game are the ones who, who are astute at understanding human psychology and knowing how to get the right answers back from the patients. Ask the right questions, get the proper answers back. So you can tell where you need to go with the case. Does that make sense to you? Yeah, and that would make and that makes sense no matter what business you're in because what you just said, the most important skill in your entire life is the psychology of your fellow man. <laughs> Everything is just about how do you get along and understand the other seven billion people you're sharing this dirt rock with that's flying around the sun once a year. It's everything. I mean, it's just everything. Trying to know this, and whenever you try to educate a dentist like that, he's like, I, I don't want to know all that liberal, soft stuff, crazy stuff. I want to know how to bone graft, you know, and it's like, okay. Right. But it, it is the most important, understanding of people. And the, and the dentists who have the best natural ability at communicating, they always go the farthest. Um, back when, um, okay, so this, so this crazy lady comes in, and I don't mean that in a sexist way, but I mean the one we all fear, the one that's going to have unrational expectations. What I don't, what I also see is I see two different markets of cosmetic dentistry. Like, I, like if I saw you come in and, and, or, or someone like, um, you know, an intelligent female lawyer, she would want totally natural teeth. And she would say, yeah, if you got to reduce teeth, uh, to make it less bulky, you got to do, you know, I, I want elegant movie star teeth. But then it seems like a lot of the veneer cases, they already come in and they got huge breast augmentation. They got dark red lipstick. They got fake eyelashes on. They, a lot of them wear a wig. A lot, a lot of cultures in Arizona, there, there are some cultural groups that nine out of 10 women are wearing a wig. I, I kid you not. So on, on that case, would it be fine to just sit there and say, well, you know, I'm a dentist and I really don't want to file down your teeth and you already look as fake as a clown. What's wrong with lumineers or what's wrong with no prep veneers when every everything on you looks like a fake balloon? Why would you reduce teeth in that case? Did that come through? Did you well, hear that? Not all of it. I think you're, you're kind of skirting around that whole the, the central issue. When you say a crazy person comes in, sometimes you can spot them right off the bat. Sometimes it takes a little bit more than that. Oftentimes your front desk is the one that warns you. But the, the question is about filing down teeth or creating – you have to go with what your core belief system is and what your philosophy is. If you feel like it's, you can do it, you can correctly execute a case – to your satisfaction and the patient's satisfaction in the minimum amount possible, the most conservative way, that's the way you should go. But follow your heart. Don't follow your bank account. Don't do not do it just because it's going to create a $10,000 bump in your accounts receivable for this month because you're going to get bit in the bind every time you think that way, speaking from experience. Okay, so now I want you to, I want you to be now specifics on, okay, you're talking to about 7,000 dentists trying to work, and, and I bet you half of them, uh, because of age, maybe they just got out of school. I don't know how many people did veneers in dental school. I mean, dental schools have enough on their plate to t take a kid from scratch to turning them loose on society in four years. Whenever I hear dentists complaining about what they don't teach kids in dental school, I'm like, dude, go go lecture in dental school. I'm in there every year. They start in with babies, and they've only got four years to turn them loose with a license. So, right. yeah, they're not going to cover – you know, and, and the dentist that's always whining has always got 30 years experience and their fellowship in the AGD, and they, they just lose laps of time of where they were right. when they got out of school. So this kid just got out of school in the last five years, and he's listening to this, and she's listening to this. She's saying, uh, uh, James, I want to be like you someday. I mean, I doubt I'll make it to the president of the AACD, but I, I want to be a good cosmetic dentist. Where would you specifically send this kid for training? Because there's lots of institutes out there. We LBIs out there, Pankies, Koi's, Spear, all these things. Give me names. Be, be specific. I know it's politically incorrect because you're a past president of ABCD yeah. and you, you can't do that. But what, what would you tell that guy for specific resources to go learn how to do this stuff? From the starting point? From the starting point. Starting point. Where, where do you go for training? That is a very fluid environment. You know, it used to be that Hornbrook had a, a, a thing – uh, Dickerson had a thing. Uh, Ross Nash had a thing that he, he you go to his institute. 
Uh, Frank Spear has a uh, special dedication to cosmetic dentistry. I don't know what it's like. Uh, John Coyce, uh, significantly, he knows everything about everything, but does he have, he has a lot of great dentists who are mentors for him. I wouldn't have any objection to going to any one of those places. Uh, Panky Institute has a wonderful program. So it's the foundational knowledge that you need in order to provide the service. Gary Alex once said, I spent my first 10 years of doing veneers, uh, learning how to make them. The second 10 years, learning how to keep them so they don't break. So these are a skill set that you have to learn. There's a lot of different ways to learn. But I will say this. The most learning advantage I ever had and have had was in doing veneers on a patient under the guidance of an instructor. In other words, a hands-on course. And they and, exist. They and who, who was that instructor? They have, well, started with Bill Dickerson and Bob Nixon in Baylor in uh, 1994. Did, and then that blossomed did, out. Did, did Bob Nixon pass away? He did. Uh, and how, he had a neat journey. He started as an endodontist true. and ended up in cosmetic dentistry. What a journey he had. That guy was amazing. And right. and, he, and then and then Dickerson. Dickerson's still at it. I, I still see uh, LVI uh, pop up. Would you, would you uh, do you recommend LVI? I can't recommend nor can I disavow. I would say that any place you go that you're going to get hands-on training is going to be beneficial to you. Just Make sure that you, the Kool-Aid, you, you drink a lot of people's Kool-Aid because you, if you just drink one flavor of Kool-Aid, you're going to go that direction all the rest of your I life. I know. Like, Does that make like, sense? Yeah, and like in dentistry, I mean, I mean, there's a controversy and everything. Like, like one of the greatest implantologists I've ever, cases I've ever seen is Bill Schaefer in London, and he just does these little short 8-millimeter fat implants, and he's done like 30,000 of them, and they work. And then in the United States, you got all these dentists saying that they just would never work. And Bill just smiles like, well, how do you do like 30,000 of them that work and then listen to people saying they won't work? And another one in, um, in, your, in your field is occlusion. You have the neuromuscular people mm -hmm. and, um, and then the conventional Dawson pinky occlusion. What, what do they call that occlusion? Neuro, what's the uh, What would you call pinky Dawson occlusion. Oh, CR versus CO, I guess you might say. Yeah. So, so what, what would you, so what would you say to that young kid who's looking at a camp, and one camp's going to have a neuromuscular occlusion, and one's going to have the old school Panky Dawson CR uh, occlusion? Um, is there? Do you have any opinion on the occlusion camps? Of course. Uh, I don't think there was a, a controversy until uh, Bill invented it. But having said all that. I think there is a place for neuromuscular, but it's not as, um, how do I put this? This is my own personal opinion, by the way. There's a place for neuromuscular dentistry, and there's a place for central relation dentistry, and the two, you have to know something about both of them, but you have to follow your heart in terms of what works best in your hand's doctor. But so I'm, trying to, never, I'm, trying, I'm trying to defend this kid who just walked out of school with $250,000 of student loans, and he's only got the budget for one camp. And he's just got this little budget and a pregnant yeah. wife at home. Yeah. Should he start with a neuromuscular camp or a Panky Dawson uh, a camp? Well, that's you know, if I if I tell you one or the other, I'm going to get into trouble. But I know I will that's say my this. that's my I have talk. lots of just, okay. You want to get me into trouble? That's, <laughs> that's fine. What? There's nobody. You can shoot all the arrows at, at me that you want. It's not going to hurt. Uh, I will tell you this. I went to see Dr. Michael Schuster in Scottsdale years ago for the business school for dentists. He was a real disciple of uh, Panky Man Schuyler. Uh, Bill um, Dawson's been to our uh, our academy and lectured there several times. Bill Dickerson's lectured there. We've had uh, Frank Spear. We've had John Coyce numerous times, numerous times. I've been been to this Koi Center, I've been to the Spear Center, I've been to LEI, I can't say, and I have not been, I've been to Dawson, but not as a student, just as an observer one time, but I would say any one of those is going to give you some sort of foundation. Where to go, you got to pick your dollar, your, I understand you have to be sensitive to your bank account, and I would say make sure that any course you go to, you're going to get the fundamentals for sure, because some of these places may want to just churn you, and once you've spent... 4000 or 5000 and now it's up to $10,000 per course, Then and you graduate from that course, then you've got to take the next and you're obligated to. I'd say take a course, get the information, settle down with that information and use it, then take the next course. Don't jump on the bandwagon and figure you have to finish the whole curriculum in a year or two years. It doesn't make sense to me. I've gone to every one of those courses you loved it, and I never have ever walked out of any of those institutes and not learned a hell of a lot of dentistry. Exactly. 
and met a right. hell of a lot of friends. And the other thing is something yeah. about those courses is that there's something about leaving your home and away from your everything. You break your routine, and now you're in a camp for you know a long time. Right. Uh, I mean, like Mitch was uh, seven three day weekends in Pittsburgh, and so it's like seven times you're going to Mecca. And your your you, all your routines are busted, and you're hanging out. It was about a dozen of us would sit in the hotel lobby bar after class every night till midnight, and and it, it just I, I I don't know how you could go to any of those institutes and not love it. And, uh, and, and I also want to tell you that the trick on John Coyce, why his veneers look better than everyone else's, is because he's a hundred percent Greek, and he sprays Windex on him when he's done, and uh, and polishes him off the Windex because he's Greek. <laughs> You'd have to see the movie My Big Fat Greek Wedding. To get oh. that joke, did you see that movie? Yeah, but I re- I don't recall that scene. Oh, oh, really? The the man every time he had something in an arm or anything, he'd spray Windex on it. I mean, his his go to like duct tape and uh, uh, you know how duct tape and WD forty is the two yeah. American things. Yeah. And my big fat Greek wedding, uh, the old man, the grandpa was always spraying everything with Windex. Okay, well, Windex is good for a lot of things. We kill ants with it here. Uh, but uh, so um, okay, so then I want I want to ask you another uh, um bizarre question and that is um it seems like men men are more competitive and when they're lecturing they're trying to blend these uh restorations with all these stain anatomy and grooves but when i personally have done this over the last 20 years and the woman has fake eyelashes and she's got breast augmentation and she's bleached her hair blonde and and you and she wants clorox white sometimes, sometimes i put stain in there and she's looking at the mirror and she goes well, why why is there well, why is it dark? And, I, and I'm like, because I took a number ten endo file and I put in stain yeah. and I totally camouflaged it in your mouth. And she's yeah. looking at me like, I don't want any of that. So so what what, what do you think about stain and 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 all that stuff? I, and and I want to give you another another nightmare scenario I did. Um, this lady came in and she owned one of the biggest um spas in Phoenix. And remember that. Who was that really expensive lab tech in like Idaho? Was it Matt or? Yeah, yeah, Matt's yeah. Cool. And my God, I sent this case to Matt, and when I got them back, they were the most gorgeous veneers. They had mammalian grooves. It started off translucent, but got darker towards the. I mean, I put those on, and this is like in, I don't know, 1987, 88, 90, something like that. They were. It was the best case I'd ever done. And the lady saw it and freaked and cried and wanted it all cut off. And then I sent him to Glidewell and made 10 white chiclets. porcelain chiclets. And she literally cried again yeah. for different reasons and kissed me and hugged me and thought they were beautiful. And to this day, every time I see those 10 chiclets, I just think, I hope to hell she doesn't tell anybody I did them. Right. How, do, how do you avoid that scenario? Exactly the same way. What you just said, you just pointed to something that's really interesting. If you have to cut off, just like Frank Spears says, is if you don't get it right the first time, when do you have time to do it Do it over, right? And how much does it cost you? Because you lose all your profit when you have to do a case over. David Hornbrook taught me one time, I've never cut off a case that was too white, but I've had to cut a few cases off that the patient thought was too dark. So it goes back to psychology. Give the patient what they want and... I don't mind having them sign a disclaimer saying, hey, please don't tell anybody I did this. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. But, but yeah, so you just have to give them what they want, and people are what they are. We, we know what the artistic portion of this is. We know what real teeth are supposed to look like. We know Matt Roberts can make them look real, and we love them, but the patient has to love them too because they're the ones who are paying our salary. I'm, I'm going to give the I'm going to give the, uh, the your your international viewers uh, today a uh, big boom, and that is uh, I've lectured in 50 countries, and I grew up I cut my teeth in this country, and I always saw a big disconnect between what male dentists thought and believed versus what female customers wanted to get. Mm-hmm. And when I go to countries like England and Finland and Norway and Estonia and Australia, I have so many male dentists come up to me. And they say things like, what is it with American teeth? They're just so white and yeah. Hollywood and people like that don't like yeah. them here. And they, they don't want to – they don't want that American crazy look. But every dentist I know in those countries, especially like London and, and, and Stockholm and these cities, I sit there and say, you know what? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start doing that American look with these big, white, beautiful, gorgeous movie star teeth. And, dude, they are crushing it. So remember – 
the number one business mistake you're going to make is projecting yourself onto 7 billion people. Sure. And I, I don't want fake eyelashes. I don't want a boob job. I don't want to wear a wig. But just because you don't want these uh, veneers, um, I – Start looking around in your town. I, you know, I think I think Europe is going to look a lot more Hollywood twenty years from now than they do today. Do you agree or disagree with that? I think you're probably right. However, I've traveled in Europe myself, and I don't I don't see a lot of. Uh, well, my I have a sister that lives in France and has for forty years. I've been there several times. I don't see a lot of emphasis on cosmetic dentistry in France at all. There might be a few dentists in Paris, and there's one guy down in Aison Provence who's a member of our academy that practices cosmetic dentistry, but I don't think it's got much market penetration there. Now, in England, I know that uh, we've had a few courses that have gone over there and been teaching hands-on courses, and then they send their lab work back here to do the lab work, and I'm sure they come out bright white. I'm sure they do. You know, it is funny. That's you a cool really thing. You really get an, an emphasis on how um, um, cosmetics is so regional in culture because I remember so many times – well, this happened to me. Uh, the most shocking was in England where this uh, beautiful woman dentist was came up and she was asking me a question at the break. And uh, she was just stunningly drop-dead gorgeous. And she reached back and scratched her head and literally had a mop of hair under her arm. And uh, you go to a lot of these countries, they don't even shave their legs. So, you know, shaving legs. When I think of a woman shaving her legs and armpits, I think of an American and a Canadian. I mean, you, there's just so many countries you don't see that. But I think the cutest one is in China. Uh, in, in Asia, um, If uh, everyone in Asia thinks the Koreans are the hottest, sexiest, best music, best dress, whatever. So whenever you're in China... If someone walks into the room and they're looking all snazzy, the other Chinese say, oh, you're looking Korean. <laughs> so I imagine this uh, cosmetic dentistry will explode first in Seoul for all of Asia. Um, but, uh, but yeah, but I'm seeing, I mean, I know dentists uh, who are doing this. So, um, you know, Howard, as an aside with that, we do have a Korean affiliate of the AACD, and they're very active and very vocal, and they love us. Um, they have a different... A, Different deal with dental insurance there. Some of it's in Japan as well. Some of it's paid for by the state. Some of it's not. So it's, it's mostly um, elective for the, for the most part, as it is here. But um, I agree with you. Uh, I spent a year in Korea as well uh, some time ago, and it's it was a third world country all the way then. It's a first world country today, South Korea. Okay, now I want to ask you the probably the most important question. You know, it, when I got my MBA, you know, the one thing the economists always beat in your head is that, you know, what monkeys say um, can only be measured with what they spend their money on, and they're never related. Like, if you go up to a consumer and say, hey, would you spend more money on a product if it was made from all natural ingredients and recycled and was made in your own town as opposed to imported from a communist country of China and made by – polluting materials and they say oh absolutely and then when they get their dollar out they go into walmart and buy the stuff from china so they stopped doing focus groups for the most part i mean focus the focus groups was a rage in the 80s and these ceos were looking at the data and saying you know we we don't see any correlation between what the focus group said and what sales happened 10 years later so it's kind of died off and so um i so price is the most important thing most economists think that 80 percent of the time this decisions come down to price. So I want you to specific. I'm going to hold your feet to the fire on this for a long time. I only got you. We're two thirds done. We're at 40 minutes. I only got you 20 more. Technology. It's expensive. I got $250,000 student loans. I just bought a practice for 400,000. My wife just bought a house for 300,000 and she's got two kids and one on the way, unless she's Mormon, then there could be eight of them. Um, what? What do I have to buy? Do I need a $150,000 CAD CAM? Do I need an $85,000 laser? Do I need a $300,000 CBCT? If I want to be a cosmetic dentist like you, I want to be Jim Hastings when I grow up, what expensive technology am I going to have to bite the bullet and get? Well, that's a great question. I don't think there is anything you have to have. I refer all my CBT, CBCT stuff for my implants to my local periodontist. He has the machine. He charges $245, which I think is dirt cheap. Uh, as far as a laser goes, I think it's nice to have. If you're uncovering implants, it's, it's uh, somewhat convenient for tissue um, modification. I personally lose, use an electrosurgery device for that because it's much more precise. I have no problem with lasers. If you want to spend the money on it, 
great. In fact, it's on my wish list to have one of those $2,500 Picasso lasers, but I just don't have one. I have had in the past. Um, I have electric hand pieces in my practice. I love them, but they're not for everybody. Yeah, that was an investment, but it wasn't a huge investment. Uh, I'd say if you just keep the patient comfortable, they're going to like you. They don't care about it. Technology does not make you a better dentist. Technology may get people to come in the door, but I don't think it makes you a better dentist, to be quite candid with you. I'd love to have something that uh, allows you to scan the preps. The iTero is a great machine. That The, the True Shape scanner is a great scanner. There's one that uh, the 3M, I forget, it's a True Definition, I think is the name of it. It's a great scanner. It's affordable. But everyone has its drawbacks, and you have to know how to work it because if you cannot introduce it into your routine and use it on a daily basis and have it make money for you, you shouldn't own it. CAD Cam. CAD Cam has gotten significant market penetration recently. I have yet to see, out of 100 CEREC restorations, 99 of them don't look good. They don't look like real teeth. Now, does the patient care? I, I don't know. I'd also say that most of them fit pretty well because the, they've got their software to the point where they can really do, give you a significantly better margin. Is it better than what a laboratory technician would do? Not necessarily. Is it less expensive? There's a huge learning curve with CAD CAM, huge learning curve. If you don't get it down, if you don't have your glazing and staining oven in the office, if you don't have an auxiliary person to run that whole program for you, then you're going to be spinning your wheels. Warren, have, Warren Buffett says that 95% of American CEOs spend 95% of their time trying to figure out how to raise their overhead. <laughs> oh, absolutely. I, I agree, yeah. Yeah, so, so, so what you just said, I mean, you and I can name personally 100 dentists that have some of the most successful practices in the world that don't have any of these, that don't have a CAD CAM, they don't have a CBCT, yeah. and they don't have a laser, and they don't have – any of these boils and whistles, and yet the the hype of the dental marketing media world oh, yeah. makes you believe that if you don't have those three things, you're a loser and a bad dentist, and your patients should go somewhere else. Well, you, you know, believe? our industry has been manufacturer driven ever since the mid '90s. Honestly, I've tested out well put. unwittingly a whole lot of materials that have failed because they put it in your hands and say, "Try this out." And by the way, you can buy it from us, and so you buy it and you use it. And then it fails. Where are you left? And I can name a couple of Ivocar products that are – it's no secret. Target but, Spectres? Yeah, well, that's one of them. <laughs> well, what was the other one? Uh, well, let's see. We had uh, Empress 2. Yeah. After Empress. Empress was a great product, but it has limitations, Empress 2. Now we have so, – so when you stop, It's phenomenal. So when you stopped using Target Spectres, did you switch to Art Glass? I did, but you know what? I hated that just as much. Yeah. So, so you younger kids that don't remember this story. So um, basically it was uh, – Material, two different materials, Targus to Vectors, and they kind of came apart. And then Horace Galzer did the art, art glass, right? Yeah. And they, they came apart. So, uh, but yeah, um, so not every company hits a home run with every product. Every, oh, we, yeah. are, we understand that. And, and, and I want to also say that um, I turn uh, 53 on uh, Saturday, and I want to tell you, younger dentists, that if I had to do it all over again, if you just said, what would you have done differently? It seems like when you come out of the starting gates, you're very susceptible to bleeding edge technology. Yeah. And when I got out of school, you want to hear my first uh, cosmetic dentistry belief system? I can um, <clears throat> that I was formally trying. Here I am paying student loan money to learn this at UMKC, that if a really hot woman comes in and you want to just do beautiful dentistry, you'll do a Dicor crown and seek minute with Duralon. <laughs> so I got out of school, and I had about 500 in the mouth before the first one fractured. Mm -hmm. Guess how many of those 500 fractured Most where I had to replace for free of charge? Yeah. Most of them. Every single one of them. I don't know of anybody that's so much. So if I had to look back, um, in fact, do you have any bleeding edge stories that you can tell these young guys to where now that I'm 53 on Friday – when I see oh, – I'll give you an example. Megagen has this new bone grafting thing. It's uh, when you take the extracted tooth, you throw it in this device and just right. instantly pulverize right. it. And with the surface area – I loved your deal. When you, that was clutch when you said uh, uh, it has more surface area than uh, Florida has coastline. Uh, and um, But you know what? 
I mean, who who knows what pulverized enamel and Denton cementum is going to do? And I think it's the greatest idea. But since I'm going to be 53 Friday, I'm going to let all the young yeah. Turks try it yeah. and let them tell me about it in five years. Because I'm not going to be the guy because I did this with implants originally. When I got into implants, guess what my state of the art was? HA coded. Yeah. Yeah, and we had problems with that. And now, how? What percent of the implants are we placing are HA coated? Probably zero. Yeah, zero. So I got burned on Dicorn Duralon big yeah. time. I got burned on um, HA coated implants. I had my diplomat implants twenty years ago, and so now when I see that really super cool Megagen, yeah, if I was twenty four, I'd jump on that like a fly on a cheeseburger at a park. But now I'm just I'm not doing it. So what? What? How would you help? this kid determine bleeding edge, leading edge, so that they don't go through a Targus Vectoris, an Art Glass, a Dicor on Duralon? That's a tough question. I, let me back up a little bit and say, as far as knowing if the Megagen is one thing, I have a periodontal specialist that I have a significant respect for and a lot of admiration for, and he knows a lot about a lot of things, and he's not willing to jump into things, but he does use a laser in his office. He uses it for the uh, the LANAP procedure, and I saw him rescue an implant that I was dead sure had failed, and the patient was dead sure it failed. That's that's what I call leading edge technology when the periodontist understands it. Now going forward, how do you pick and choose on what to use? Well, even those these, these dental journals that we get are, and I probably got one laying around here. Are, they're mostly not peer reviewed or well peer reviewed, and they're full of advertisements. You got to watch what you're reading. Make sure that you read your literature and and be, you know, look at it with a little bit of a, take it as scans. Don't, don't take it for, for, for gospel when you see something written down just because one guy does it. In fact, I have gone so far as to call the author of an article when I thought I needed to know more about it and get it directly from the horse's mouth. So, do your I, own I, you know, that, that, that is, that is, uh, that is a very, that's, that's the hottest tip of the day. And another thing is the one thing, um, the internet allowed it as loud as community. So when you're reading a paper from a journal and you're not sure, go to Dental Town and post yeah. it and say, Hey, I just read this article all by myself alone, one way, like a radio, TV, billboard, or the newspaper right. man just drives by and just throws the paper in your driveway and didn't give a shit what you think about anything you just read. Post it on a community and say, I just read this. I'm thinking that this is good. Do you guys all agree? And see what the community says, because some smart guy like you might get on there and say, hey, that, that, that was sponsored by this company, and I talked to the author, or maybe the author even get on, but, you know, don't practice alone. That's why, uh, that's the one thing I don't like about podcasts is because I always fear that dentists, uh, dentists tend to be introvert. They tend to be introvert, geek, engineer, scientist, mathematician, and they're, they're a lot of them are loners, and I want them to be more social. That's what you said about the, the best thing for you to join the AACD was all the colleagues you met, all the people yeah. you met, all the friendships you met. And uh, so be more community, be more interactive. And when you read these things, th there's no reason you need to be out there alone. There's other sharp minds that can interact with you with your questions. Yeah, your, your, uh, your forum has been really remarkable for a lot of people. And uh, when it first came in to being, I was a little bit reluctant to jump in there because everybody has an opinion. And, of course, my opinion is right. Right, yeah. but I, you know, I come to find that you start reading some of these threads, and there's some pretty bright people that are contributing. It's a that's a great forum, a great forum. So I really have to congratulate you for that. About we just we just passed two hundred and two thousand members and passed four hundred and uh, four million posts. So two hundred and two thousand members uh, have posted four million times. And um, so, will we ever get a uh, CE course out of you? Because the reason I would love to have a CE course out of you is not only uh, I mean, you're so, uh, I mean, you, I mean, you've been doing this for, how, how many years have you been a dentist? Um, a lot, a lot of years. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm at 28 years, and you're past president of AAC. I, I wish you'd give, uh, build us an online CE course and call it down-to-earth, real-world uh, cosmetic dentistry. You know, what? Me, you know actually, our, our academy does have an uh, online CE that's really getting some market penetration. It's getting some, some notice. Uh I'll look into that. I promise to do that. I know you've talked to me about this years well, you know, ago. 
Yeah. Well, but, you know what? So, so, so talk about that. So if you go to, what is it? AACD.org? AAC. Is it? No, it's dot .com. It's dot .com. AACD.com. Right. And so tell my viewers, what, what kind of CE do you have on there? You know, um, it's a brand new platform. And to be candid with you, I was so busy last year just doing the presidential stuff. And this thing was introduced. I can't, I can't, I can't tell you with any degree of veracity exactly what's there. Well, do you, you know what, um, if, um, you know what you should seriously think about marketing 101 is um, a lot of other companies do this. We put up, um, I think it's uh, 327 courses, and they've been viewed uh, 550,000 times. So wow. 300 courses got a half million views. And what some people are doing is if, if they got like a, a six-segment CE course, they'll put the first one on Dental Town for free. They'll give up the first one and then say, if you want to watch two through six, go to this different website. Right. So if you've already got the content on the AACD um, and you want to do uh, – you've already got your cost. If you want free marketing, put the first deal on Dentaltown and then uh, send them to your website for uh, two through six or whatever. I'm going to write that down. Or, or they can just do it the old-fashioned way and make money and just put it on Dentaltown for sale. Yeah. Um, what we do – what our business model is on the Dental Online CE, you put it on there – and I got 50 employees, so we'll collect. You you set the price, we'll collect the money and split it with you 50 50. It's a very simple business model. So if you guys already got all those courses and just want revenue, you can put every single one of those courses on Dental Town, set your own price, we'll collect the money, split it with you 50 50. But uh, um, my whole, um, I just want these guys to learn. My, my, my whole mission is to try to get dentists to learn faster, easier, higher quality, lower in cost. Yeah. And my real passion is not the 20 richest countries in the world, even though. I live in the richest country in the world. My, my truest passion is to get smart guys like you to put all your information on uh, the website and then give it to free to Africa, Asia, and Central and South America. And when I go into some of those dental schools, those deans literally break down and cry because Dental Town is basically the entire curriculum of their dental school. I have heard that in some countries of the world, that's their entire curriculum is online stuff, internet yeah. stuff. And I walked in. I walked into a dental school one time, and I didn't think that dean was going to let go of me. I mean, she just cried for like five minutes. She said, "She said before Dental Town, she goes, all we had is Mandarin Chinese books that were 20 years old and French books that were 20 years old, and no one in our school speaks Mandarin Chinese or French. And then we found Dental Town, and you made it for free for our country, all that online scene. And she goes, that, that's all we do. That's all we do. We just we, All day, we just sit around one computer monitor and read threads and online C courses and it's uh and that's why I my other biggest mission on the online CE is we have so many courses on like computer generated implant Star Wars driven you know Ob1 yeah. Kenobi dentistry but when you go but there's seven billion people that that only applies to one billion patients yeah. three billion people live off three dollars a day and nobody in the AACD is going to build me a course no. on how to make a cosmetic flipper. And there's more girls that would have their life change from a cosmetic flipper than upper 10 veneers. No one's, you know, so when I look at cosmetic dentistry for the planet, a flipper, a removable, a denture. I, I love the fact that Iclair, Ibeclair has taken dentures serious and they, they got their Bluetooth line. And yeah. they're because when we were little denture teeth, you could spot them a mile away. And now with some of these high-end denture teeth, they, they look all natural. So yeah. I've only got you for five minutes. So I want to well, get you... I, I've got a patient, actually, I just got notification I've got to get to the visit. But I wanted to say one thing about cosmetic dentistry being a specific process on a discipline. I think a lot of people are, are shy away from our academy because the accreditation, one of the part, part of it has to do with direct bonding. I just saw a direct bonding case I did 10 years ago. Does it, does it look great? No, it needs some touch-up. And the patient understands it. She went in and out of braces with it. And now she wants to touch back up. No problem. I can do that. So direct bonding, flippers, whatever you want. It allows us to have a much, much larger palette with which to paint our, you know, spread our paintbrush on. Does that make sense to you? Absolutely. Um, yeah. Hey, I I'm, um, <clears throat> go ahead. One way to get good at it is to do a lot of it. Yeah, I, I, I think, I think uh, for me, when a patient ever needs veneers, I always tell them, if it was me personally, I would do direct composite. We, we can always go do veneer, but I love direct yeah. composite, composite veneers. Uh, I just absolutely love it. But, hey, uh, you got a patient in the chair. 
Uh, yeah. I just want to tell you, uh, congratulations on your career, man. That That's amazing. I mean, did you ever think when you came out of dental school you'd be the uh, president of the American Academy of Cosmetic Dentistry? I didn't think of it until just a few years before it happened, actually. No, 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 no. It was all political. I didn't want to do it. I loved the examination portion of it. I loved the camaraderie. I loved being with the examiner. I loved learning more about it. But when it got into the political side of it, it became something that had to be done. And that's so, probably why I, you became the president because I, you know, I've, I've been in the room with you with so many big egos in the room, and, and, and I always thought that you were the most down-to-earth, humble, yeah. real-world guy. You could, it didn't matter who you're in the room with. Uh, um, you were just – I just think you're just a great person, a great oh, guy. Yeah. And uh, thank you for Stop. all the – what's that? Stop. Stop no, no, I'm serious, man. I mean, you, you and I have been in some meetings before where we're rolling our eyes with some of these guys out there that are literally Napoleonic characters, you know. And uh, and, uh, and dentistry has their 1% of, uh, you know, yeah. big, big egos. And uh, you were always the oh, yeah. most you, – you had the same amount or more talent and just a down-home country boy. I mean, I grew up in Kansas, and you remind me of someone who grew up in Kansas. I mean, just a down-home country boy. And so thank you for all that you've done for dentistry. Okay. Uh, go treat your patient. And now my goal is to get, uh, get my neighbor Joyce Bassett to do a one to follow up yours. I'm going to launch yours and then follow it with Joyce. Yeah. Thank you, Howard, for what you've done for the profession. You got my respect. All right, buddy. We're even on there. Okay. Thanks for a great hour. Good. Thank you.